Good morning. Yes, I'm a lawyer. Yes, I'm, I'm here to help you. And, and in fact, I'm, I'm actually passionate about helping physicians. That's what I've been doing for the last 30 years. I've either been in the courtroom with you, or I've been spending my time trying to keep you out of the courtroom. And that's what really brings me to this topic. And I think at this point in time right now, because what's happened in the last several months, this is going to become more important than ever. I thought the last talk was excellent. And as always, when you hear it, it's sort of eye-opening, isn't it? It's coming down the tracks like a very, very fast freight train. And it's not going to slow down. So what I want to do is put this in context. And it has to be in context for you to truly understand how you can get prepared for what's occurring, you've got to understand the liability landscape. Because it's changing, and it's changing very significantly. And what I'm going to do is give you a look from the front line. Because I, either myself or with lawyers I work with around the country, I have a case in court at any given time. And so you learn a ton in the courtroom. Sometimes you're learning the hard way in the courtroom to learn a ton, and I'm going to try to share that with you today. The HR value proposition, you really heard that, although I'll touch on that. I have a couple of comments about that. And then really what we want to do is be proactive today, is we want to take what we've learned so far with liability and EHR and, and try to put in some mitigation practices, try to make it easier for you. So the liability landscape, <laughs> I, I wish we could roll out the electronic medical record, you know, sort of in a vacuum, right? I mean, it's hard enough to do. But if everyone, and I mean the lawyers, would just leave you alone and let you do it for five years or 10 years, and let you sort of get through the glitches a little bit, and let you get used to using an electronic medical record, which is a dramatic change, I agree with the prior speaker. It's, the, it's a done deal. We're not going back. Anyone that's waiting, thinking that in five years we'll go back to paper, it's not happening. We've been watching this for a decade or longer. It's been accelerating. If you look at the new regulations for ACOs or the health care reform, which I have a dozen lawyers pouring over for months, I will tell you that the future is actually, in this respect, pretty clear that this is going to continue to roll out. Now, folks, listen, let me be very realistic with you. The lawyers, and you know what I mean by lawyers, right? I don't mean lawyers. I mean the plaintiff's lawyers are doubling down on this. They are having meeting after meeting in basements of million-dollar mansions, planning on what do we do with the electronic health record. They've hired some of the finest consultants in the country to help them understand what can the electronic health record produce? What are the glitches? What's going to happen? And obviously, don't be naive. What they're trying to do is use it to their advantage. So they're doubling down. I mean, we've seen frequency in this country sort of come down over a period of about seven or 10 years nationally. We saw in 2010, and you'll start to see this in your literature, it started to creep up again. Uh, we believe in 2011 it's going to creep up, not dramatically, but it's going to creep up because of some things that are happening in the environment. But severity, folks, severity, frequency being how often you get sued, severity being how big the award is, has never slowed down. And in fact, many of us think there, was, think there was a very careful laid out plan by the plaintiff's bar to take less cases but make more money, which you do by increasing severity, which, folks, have, has gone up 100% in the last five years. And so frequency starting to tick up, severity going up dramatically. The courtroom, I wish I could say that it was you know, tech people in the courtroom or doctors in the courtroom. And I'm talking about 
in the courtroom deciding these cases. It's jurors. And who, who are 100% of our jurors? They're patients. They're Joe Public. And so they're seeing and reading everything that our neighbors are. What the plaintiff's lawyers are doing constantly is looking for the plus factor in cases. Because when we researched all of the seven, eight, not all, but many, seven, eight, and nine figure verdicts, almost 100% of them had the so-called plus factor in them. And the plus factor is something, it's not the medicine, it's not the misdiagnosis, it's not the test result, it's not the judgment call. The plus factor is something that can get those patients, right, the jurors, get them fired up and get them angry. A lack of communication or an alleged cover-up or a document that wasn't reviewed or a practice pattern that wasn't followed or was ignored. Something that can get those patients fired up. I mean, it's clear that's where those numbers are. And EHR, many think, could be the next plus factor. That's why we got to talk about it. Um, just another minute on the lawyers. It, it, all over the country, but in your community too, they are, re, they are, again, doubling down on the organization that they have. Here in South Carolina, they've got a great website. They let each other know about all the big verdicts, about all the big studies, about all the big trends. They're all over healthcare. They understand healthcare, and they're pushing the numbers up. And your numbers here uh, are going up as well, a $3 million verdict and then a $12 million verdict, which is described, and when it's described by the commentators, it's right there, folks, in the top line. Can they get the jury, or they got the jury, angry enough? Because, again, that's, what the, that's the trend in creating dollars. So, so why do we talk about it? We talk about it because I'm concerned that there's certain elements, the electronic medical record, that could become the plus factor. And folks, it's not a hypo. In fact, have become the plus factor. So here's what we're going to do together. The key, and of course, your own insurance company here in South Carolina, which I'm privileged to uh, be involved in, focuses on this tremendously. The key, folks, is for all of us to focus here on risk in the first instance. For all of us to take the data and analyze it and say, you know what, why, where, how do we get sued? And then do something about it here. Listen, we can go and defend the daylights out of you in court, and we can win that case. I don't know if that's a great win for you. <laughs> the great win for you is right here, right? You'll take prevention any day of the week. That's what we have to focus on. So let's walk through this. The value proposition, I thought I was going to have to talk to that. I thought the prior talk was excellent in that regard. Um, they're long term, you know, we can see. We can see the benefit, whether it's medication alerts, whether it's preventative care alerts, whether it's analysis of data, which is a lot of what's going on. Uh, long term, whether it's incentive payments and you saw them all, I mean, we can see those benefits. But again, they're going to happen, as you saw in the prior slides, not over a year or a few years, but over a decade. And I, I would submit much, much longer than that. I think the folks, the patients, and the doctors who benefit from electronic medical record aren't in this room. I don't think they're through medical school yet. I think it's going to be that generation that will really be able to embrace the value that they're in fact supposed to be. I will say that I, I think in fact, uh, if I look at the ACO regulations and I sort of look at what's happening in the future, I, I don't see how you possibly, and I'm sorry to use I guess a word you could accuse me of a little bit of commentary, but uh, I don't see how you could possibly escape using EMR. And I, I, I think you have to. I think you're ill-advised for anyone to think, even if they're retiring in a couple of years, that I'm just not going to use it. Because whether it's the ACO requirements, whether it's what's happening with deducts in years to come, I think you just got to say, I got to get on the boat. My point is, let's get on the boat together. Let's understand where the pitfalls are with the boat. And let's do something about those. 
Nationally, what did we see? We've studied the daylights out of this, not just myself, PhDs and tech, tech people and doctors and psychologists and, lawyer, and jury consultants. We, wrote, we, we tried to roll this out far too fast. I mean, it was underestimated how difficult it would be to roll out an electronic medical record. And it was really underestimated how big of a cultural change was this. I mean, at talks five years ago, eight years ago, people were saying, you know, we're going to roll it out, you're going to go to a seminar, and it's going to be great. You're going to make a lot of money. Well, it didn't turn out that way. It is a different culture. It changes the way a doctor practices. It changes the way they interact with patients. It changes the way they interact with each other and with staff. You think about it. If you have, if you're you know, waist deep in the electronic medical record, it, it takes your breath away. And I've, I've, I've been there. And I've been there for some of the bumps. We know that really what you need when you incorporate this into your practice, and I'm not talking about the hospital who has all sorts of resources. I'm talking about in your medical practice. You know, your independent physician practicing out there in the community, you're going to need an implementation team. You're going to need to do some what we call expectation management, which means understand it is not a sil silver bullet. Understand it's not going to be a seminar. It's going to take training that's ongoing and never ends. It's a real cultural shift in your practice. In South Carolina, you're actually ahead of, I think, most states, because I think you have more support. You're more organized than a lot of states around the country. All right, now let me put my litigation glasses on, because you really sort of got to come, <laughs> you're going to have to sort of come to my world for, uh, for a couple minutes. You see, he, here's what happened. Here's what happens in the courtroom. And I'm going to be very blunt with you, because that's the only way I can help you. What happens in the courtroom is this is what we see all the time. We see great big blow-ups on the screen. And you know, courtrooms now have <coughs> screens that are larger than this. I mean, there's a lot of technology in the courtroom. Courtrooms that are being built now are wired for tremendous technology. I mean, it's, they've really turned into sort of shows more than anything else. But this is what we see. And this is what the public is seeing. This is what jurors see, right? That the electronic medical record prevents medical mistakes, prevents medical errors, is going to make it safety. And whether those speeches are political or whatever, doesn't matter. What your jurors are hearing is, in fact, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be safer out there. And boy, if you use the electronic medical record, if your practice has that, holy cow, no mistakes, no errors. It's the safest place. It's where I'm going, right? That's what our jurors are seeing. And then the lawyers, of course, come into the courtroom and take those statements and those preconceived ideas that these Patients, and I mean jurors, already have, and they just drive it home, right? And yet we all know that errors are still going to occur and have occurred. And a lot of the literature came out. You know, data, data loss, system capabilities, IT complications, patient death. I mean, it's not that we didn't know about this. We do. Uh, so in the literature, you know, you'll see comments, you know, like this. This is a nightmare for me. For these reasons, it is nearly impossible for electronic records to reproduce exactly what the physician saw on his or her screen at the time of the incident, especially one that occurred years ago. This is by an expert. Now, now do you understand what they're saying? That when I get to court, I'm not going to be able to show what you saw when you were treating the patient. There's going to be updates and corrections and changes. And what's the plaintiff's lawyer going to say about that? Are you kidding me? You corrected the record since you saw my client? Or, 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 or my client's husband who's not here? <laughs> the plaintiff. I mean, so we've sort of known this, but I'll bet you haven't heard a lot about it. We're not talking about it. Let's, let's walk through some of the things that have actually caused claims. 
start real fundamentally at the get-go. Uh, for those of you who know me, know I'm a very, very big proponent of patient satisfaction. And I think, in fact, the relationship that a doctor has with the patient is the absolute best protection they have, bar none. And whether you look at Dr. Hickson's materials, whether you look at the University of Michigan's, whatever you look at, there's dozens of studies. I did the Press Ganey study, which is probably the largest, right, in which we looked at hundreds of thousands of data points and came to the clear conclusion that there's a relationship between satisfaction and litigation. And it's sort of an inverse relationship. You know, if you can't achieve patient satisfaction, you're going to have more, you're going to have more lawsuits. And those lawsuits are going to be more serious. So this is a very big deal. So when I get questions from my docs, right, that Jim, I'm having trouble communicating with my patient and forming that warm, loyal relationship because I have a laptop in between me and the patient. Because I have the laptop here and I'm talking to the patient, sometimes peeking over the top of it to make sure that they're understanding what I'm saying. Or I'm so distracted by everything I've got to do on my laptop that I'm not communicating well with the patient. I mean, you've seen this. This is well known. It's why we're trying to set up, you know, set up the EMR differently. Put it on the wall so you and the patient can look at, you know, can look at the EMR together. No, go through the labs together, go through the x-ray, do whatever you have to do to make sure that you're still maintaining that relationship. You, if EMR gets in the way, and we're, we're, this, this is first base, right? If it gets in the way of the relationships that you've spent decades creating with your patients, we have a problem. Right? And, and, and remember, you're also going to be graded and rated on patient satisfaction as a component of comp in the future as well. Don't do it for that reason though. Do it because maintaining that relationship with the patient and their family, I think is the single most important thing that you need to accomplish. And so we're going to have to be careful and mindful when we start using our electronic medical record. What about when all of these records are talking to each other? <clears throat> well, what we're seeing again from a pragmatic standpoint is this, does this change the standard of care? All of a sudden, you have all of this information, which is not down the hall, which is not at another hospital, which is not down in radiology. It's a click away. Are you required to look at it all? Are you required to look at more information? How about, and these are real cases, how about when your patient comes to the emergency department and has a thumb drive? and says, here, doc, take, you know, I got everything right here. Take a look at it. It's, it's my medical record from the last seven years. A lot of good literature. Got a lot of scans there. Go take a look. Come back and talk to me. What are you going to do? Give it back to them? You're not going to look at it all. Same thing happens with specialists who are on call. And I love orthopedic surgeons. Okay, but my orthopedic surgeon says, I got a call from a patient who said, I'll be emailing you in just a moment. And you'll get my email, has all of my blood pressures, has all of my x-rays scanned, has all the newest literature I found on the internet. So check out the email and call me back. Is the on-call physician going to do that? D d do they have to do that? I mean, are we changing the standard of care as to what information that you have to review to treat a patient? And I hate to tell you this, I'm going to give you a lawyer's answer. We don't know. Maybe, if there's relevant information, which in retrospect could have been very helpful to your diagnosis, you better believe the plaintiff's lawyer will find an expert that says, of course, he should have looked at that and he didn't want to, t to take the time. I mean, you know we're gonna hear that because we hear that in the court now. What about input errors? So when I was told by vendors, and I know there's vendors and there's vendors, meaning that there's, there's ones that are that are, that are great, uh, and there's others that probably uh, could spend more, uh, more time um, with their clients. But when this all started, we started to input information, meaning it could be scanned or scribed. What we were told is we, po we won't possibly be able to do it, so it's all right. 
that there's going to be a certain potential of heirs, which is why we had you know, reports of, you know, he is pregnant again, right? Or he's coming out of his second bout of rehab, except that he's only two years old, okay? We had information in the medical record that clearly was an heir. 8%, 10%, 12% different studies said it's just not gonna be right. What, what folks we talked to said is that's a glitch. That's a known complication of trying to input a massive amount of data from one place to another, and it's gonna happen. And over years of use of the medical records, doctors will pick up on those incorrect information and there'll be a way in which they can change it. And so they'll sort of cleanse the record over four or seven or 10 years. Of course, again, that glitch is not a defense uh, in a case in which you used information that's incorrect. Um, we also know that with cutting and pasting, if you move an error, that error can be moved to a lot, a lot more additional places far more quickly and is very hard to undo. So often there is just errors that are called glitches, which you should not tolerate, which in part is a vendor issue and something that should be in your vendor contract and something that you ought to be talking about. The key from a mitigation standpoint is when there is a glitch that there's a learning for why the glitch occurred and there's some software changes so they don't occur again in the future. What about as a medical group? Well, what you also have is when you incorporate the EMR, you gotta be all in. And, and I hear this all the time, where I hear some members of the group say, you know what, I, it's just not for me. Or, you know, I'm about four years out, so I'm not gonna learn it. You know, or there's a staff that's reluctant. When you're gonna incorporate this, you're all in. It's all the doctors in the group, it's all the staff in the group. And you're going to have to have training because you could end up with a claim of failure to train if you do not. First of all, you want to train because you don't want errors or mistakes. And you, you, you're going to be all in. You're going to have ongoing supervision and training. You have new people coming in all the time. They've got to be trained. You have someone coming in that's maybe you know, just coming in for three months. They have to be trained. You have to supervise. And I would even suggest, and a lot of folks aren't doing this, please be ahead of the curve in this regard, we are now having cases where the plaintiff's lawyers are asking for all your information on training in discovery. They want to know how you trained. They want to see the, the list of the people that went to the training program. They want to see your file that your office manager has on training, on the electronic medical record. And you know your office manager should have one because that's something in which is, is going to start to be requested more and more. You're all in, which means you now have a system. You've got to update that system. You've got to purchase those updates that are going to come time and time again. And when you're incorporating the, the electronic health record, you've got, you have to think about that. It's not just a one-time expense. There's additional expenses that are going to take place. Again, you're going to have to make sure you know up front and that you're going to be able to cover that expense as well. Because if you don't keep it up to date, if you don't update the training, it's going to be a plus factor. All of this, as I'll show you in a minute, is going to be subject to discovery. Now, one of my favorite, I sh one of my favorite, when I say that, I mean one that drives me probably just about as crazy as anything is clinical decision support prompts. And like so many things, it's a pendulum. And this seemed like a very good idea, and we can all see the benefit. You know what I'm talking about, right? I'm talking about the, the, the pop-ups that occur. So that when you put certain information in, you'll get help. And that help will be in the form of a best practice that will recommend certain additional testing or certain additional evaluation. And for a while, this became very, very popular, and unfortunately, what we started to see is that it was being used in the courtroom. So what would happen, for example, is the patient would come into the emergency department, have vague symptoms, you know, sort of achy, a headache, a little bit of a fever, you know, not sure how long it's been, right? It's in, it's in a wooded, you know, it's part of the country that's a wooded area, 
it's during tick season, um, and uh, there's a pop-up. So the pop-up comes up, and the pop-up says Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. Check for Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. Unfortunately, what happened in that particular case, real case, is as that pop-up came up, the doctor, just like he always did, immediately crushed the pop-up, which you can do. Immediately closed it. And so that patient was discharged, came back, and died from Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. And it was a young patient with a young family and a very high wage earner. So you know what that means. That's a multi-million dollar claim, which turned into an even bigger claim. Because, in fact, what the lawyer was able to show is that this particular doctor was on the committee who recommended the electronic medical record. And because the lawyer, through discovery, could get all the committee minutes, he got something good like the doctor saying, this is, this is incredible. It's going to make it so much safer, right? And then the lawyer was able to show that this pop-up, this safety pop-up came up because they can now get to the metadata, the data behind the data, which times everything to the second. So he's able to show that the safety pop-up came up and within two seconds was closed, obviously not being read. So now you have a multi-million dollar case and you have a safety prompt that's coming up that was in fact ignored. A case that ended up sadly uh, involving punitive damages. You may say, this, that's isolated, this probably never happens. It happens all the time. The, the studies show that most prompts are overridden. Most are overridden. In the real world, that's where I live, in the real world. My doctors tell me, I don't want the prompts. They feel the prompts are unsafe, because they say the prompts distract them, you know, that they don't need it. Medicine's an art, it's a science. You know, I don't need it, I don't want it, I'm so worried about them, I worry more about the prompts than I do about taking care of the patient. Listen, this is a big, pe I've heard it all, folks. It's a big pendulum. And so many, like so many things in life, what's, where's the truth? It's right smack in the middle. There is a place for prompts. We have far too many right now. And we have to go through a critical process of together deciding what needs to be in there and what doesn't need to be in there. And you know what? If it needs to be in there, then we got to look at it. Because if we don't, we're creating a tremendous problem for ourselves. Additional risk issues with the prompts, you know, who keeps it current? Who creates them? Is there two schools of thought? Do you use the judgment rule? I mean, there's, this is just loaded with various legal issues. What about electronic communications? This is sort of interesting because uh, more and more doctors every year, these are studies, say, you know, we'd like to communicate with patients online. And now I have uh, a number of big self-insured you know, employers that say, you know, I'd like to reimburse online. That I think the movement is going to be online. Uh, and, and, and I'm of, of the belief that that's going to happen more and more. It's a problem. We all know that. Again, back to that relationship. How do you create an on online relationship? And this isn't a dating service, right? I mean, we really need to get information from our patients and often, more often than not, ask a follow-up question. And so online communication can be very difficult. It's a challenge for the providers because you've got to start thinking about, boy, who's going to check the email? I mean, in my office. Who's going to respond to the email? Well, what about HIPAA? What about all the privacy uses? You're going to have to have disclaimers to the patients. You're going to have to have policies and procedures in your office as you start, and you will start to do online communications. The jury's out on this. Patients want it, but they don't trust it. And with patient portals right down, you know, right down the road, really here, it's going to happen. And I think all of us need to start preparing for how we're going to electronically communicate with our patients. So real case, uh, Dr. Smith, second trimester pregnancy, very small spotting in my underwear. In my first two pregnancies, I had the same issues. Not a lot of blood. Just wondering if I should come see you. I got an appointment Monday. R right? Response, nurse practitioner, doctor never sees this. Thanks for the email, probably nothing to worry about. If it increases, call. Otherwise, 
Sia Monday. What happens? Of course, fetal demise, right? Because there is additional bleeding, and there's a lot of words in this email communication back and forth that, in retrospect, are going to be very, very unclear. Folks, as you start to communicate with your patients electronically, this screams policies, procedures. You must do not do it without policies and procedures. So your office understands under what circumstances to do so and what thresholds in which you will not. And there's word choice issues and there's disclaimer issues. So there's a great big red flag here. Now, now we're electronic. Now we've gone electronic, right? So what's that mean? That means, like when I started practice and I got the medical record from my doctor, he sent it to me, you know, in, a, in an envelope. Sometimes I'd get 30 years of treatment on a postcard. That, that probably is not right. Um, but, but nowadays, right, as we move from paper to electronic, I will tell you what's being discovered is very, very different. You see, as I mentioned before, this metadata, th this information that's behind the electronic medical record is robust. It has everything. Um, there's a room in the hospital. It's hard to get in there. You've got to have like secret codes. And it's literally a room in which you can get at all the information that's in the electronic health record. All of it. You can see every person who looked at the record, when they looked at it exactly, how long they looked at it exactly. I mean, it's, it's, it's unbelievable, the information. So in a case I had last week where the doctor told me, saying, I never saw the x-ray. I didn't see it. Saying, well, it's right here in the record. You saw it. You saw it on the 19th, and you looked at it for seven seconds. I said, what? What do you got? You got one of those devices on my iPhone, you know, that you're watching me? I said, it's all right here. Or a case from a month ago where something unfortunate and traumatic happened in the hospital a patient death, surprising, a young person. And so when we looked at the electronic record and behind the record, 29 people had looked at the record that weren't treating the patient. 29 people who all you know, were surprised, concerned, shocked, curious. Don't you think that happened with the paper record all the time? Don't you think people pulled up x-rays all the time to just see, I wonder what happened? can't believe she had a cancer. All of that is information is now captured. Those 29 people, 27 of them violated HIPAA. Right? All of them just got an invitation to, uh, to a deposition, right? which, um, which they're not going to enjoy. So the, the actual chart is changing. We've got to get the word out to your colleagues, because in my experience and in my travels, uh, a, a lot of people do not, do not realize that. Uh, sometimes timing can be often. Sometimes corrections are tracked after the fact. Sometimes there's some misinformation. Uh, we had a sales rep who told one of our administrators that there's this great new feature. You can write information sort of almost like post-its, like an old-fashioned post-it, but it's in the electronic medical record, and it's completely private. Completely private. Don't worry about it. So people were putting on the post-it things you don't want anyone to ever see, right? right? Watch out for Mrs. Smith. You can never trust her. She drinks too much. You know? Watch out for Mr. So-and-so. He's always trying to look up the girl's skirts. I mean, all this stuff that's obviously would never be in the record, it's on a so-called post-it, all of which are discovered. Because, of course, post-its are discoverable. Everything that touches the electronic health record is discoverable and is attached. What about when you're asked to provide the record? It used to be an easy task. Your office manager would get the record, right? Now what do you get? You actually have to have a process to create that record because the record includes not only progress notes but teaching agenda, after visit summaries, appointment logs, comments, notes, emails, and it just goes on and on and on. If you look at sort of your national literature, you'll see everything that we're talking about. Alerts, right, part of the record. Email messaging, part of the record. Instant messaging, post-it notes, clinical pathways, all of this, right, all of this is part of the record. And we've got to realize that when we're inputting into the record. So what are we going to do? 
first of all, today is the first step. And I really applaud you for spending the time that you are uh, on this program. You've got to continue. Our doctors need more information on this topic. In your hospital, in your practices, your business managers, you, we need to get the word out because people are inadvertently putting themselves at risk. As you can see, a lot of these things are really very pragmatic. Physicians must be involved, must be the champions of this. And I think in years gone past, some, you know, some of our physicians stepped back and they let administrative, and I love administrative people, they let tech people sort of take the lead. Physicians must take a leadership role in this as we go forward. If you're going to use the electronic health record, you need to have a full assessment. You've got to understand how you're going to implement it, and then you've got to really make that understand the investments forever. The E, you know, this, I've heard this time and time again. You know, this is a work in progress. This will not end. I mean, it's not a program for 30 minutes, and then some clicks, and you move on. Work with your vendors. Hold your vendor's feet to the fire. Look at those contracts. Make sure your lawyers look at those contracts. So when glitches occur, that there's very clearly set forth who's going to be responsible to help fix that glitch. Make sure with these clinical decision support tools, I say we take a step back. And I say we have too many. And again, doctors need to be involved. Professional societies need to be involved on, you know, specialty by specialty. What prompts do we really need? And then we have to understand that we need to use them, and we need to start putting some disclaimers with these prompts, which we presently in most systems, in fact, do not have. Policies and procedures. A lot of this lends itself. I'm sorry about that. I know it sort of drives you crazy to think there has to be more policies and procedures. I'm sorry. We got to do it because policies and procedures set forth evidence that you're being responsible about all of this. And then following your own policy and procedure in a consistent fashion is your best protection. So if you're going to communicate, for example, with your patients via email, you make sure that there's a threshold when that occurs and when that doesn't occur. You make sure your nurse practitioner and your physician assistant, who as it turns out, are the individuals more often than not that are communicating with your patient, that they're either doing so pursuant to best practices or that they have certain thresholds. Certain things that are either defaulted, referred to you, or defaulted and the patient needs to come in because it's very difficult and we've already seen these cases. It's interesting, patients want to communicate with you electronically. But when you breach their privacy, and you don't let them know that when you send the email to their email account at home, and they happen to have their screen up in their kitchen, that someone else may see it, I mean, they have to, that's going to happen. They have to know that. I mean, there's very practical things, right? It's not as if you are sitting by your computer waiting for your patients to email you, and you'll immediately email back. That's not the way, obviously, it's occurring. Someone at the end of the day, and the someone typically is a mid-level provider, and that's fine, is responding to all these various emails. Patients need to be told. You're going to need to send to the patient and get them to sign off on a document that says, I want to electronically communicate with you. I've read the rules. I understand. It's going to be like informed consent, folks. I read the rules. I understand the rules. I'll abide by the rules. And those patients are going to sign off on that. So they know that the privacy that they have electronically is not like the privacy that they have in your office. They know they can't email you. And again, everything I've told you, it's the only benefit of being old, is you get to see a ton. Everything I've told you has actually happened. None of it is hypothetical. You know, so I have the case where the patient is emailing their doctor saying they need to see him emergently. And of course, they don't get a response back because the doctor's not there. So they email again seven minutes later. Did you get my email? I need to see you emergently. And there's a set now of six or seven emails 
from the patient who's getting furious because the email's not being responded to. And they finally called the office, you know, for the sole purpose of yelling at the doctor for not responding to the email. Of course, they were told, go to the emergency department. <laughs> you know, go to the emergency department. Now, in that practice, there had to be a bounce back to the patient, right, on the first email. If it's an emergency, call 911, sort of like we do with the phone. But what I'm telling you is because all this electronic communication, visitation, is so new, we're not thinking about and thinking through those types of things. And so we have to as, as we all sort of get involved in, in the new world. So, you know, in conclusion, you know, what, what do I see? Um, you know, I, I think I agree with the first speaker. Uh, I, I think this is going to continue to, I think it's going to accelerate. Um, I think it's inescapable. Um, I, I think, and I've said this before, this is a little bit of a political statement, but, you know, what I've said about healthcare reform and really realizing the benefit of it in the future, what we want to, the thing that's going to hold us back more than anything is the lack of comprehensive tort reform at the federal level. Because every one of these issues for us, for our doctors, right, these are liability issues when you ought to be not thinking about liability but focusing on what you love to do, take care of patients. The best I can do is give you some strategies and help you incorporate strategies that as the liability pops up, let's get you a practical, you know, sort of pragmatic strategy to reduce it. I wish I could say, wish I could stand up here and say, I can eliminate it, we can't. But some of these issues that you have here, these have all happened. So incorporate the strategy, uh, let's, let's see if we can have it happen a little less here in, in South Carolina. Okay, thank you very much.